Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to cover chapter 5 for our MCAT behavioral science playlist. This chapter is titled Motivation, Emotion, and Stress. And in this chapter, we're going to cover three objectives. The first objective is about motivation. Here we're going to define motivation as the purpose or driving force behind our actions. And to really understand this, we're going to cover a couple of theories. They're going to include instinct theory, arousal theory, drive reduction theory, and need-based theories. Then we'll move on to objective two, which is titled emotions. Here we're going to discuss the three elements of emotion in addition to universal emotions and the adaptive role and theories of emotion before we cover the role of the limbic system in regulating emotion. Then, for our third objective, we'll talk about stress. Here we'll cover cognitive appraisal of stress, types of stressors, as well as the physiological, emotional, and behavioral responses to stress. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started with objective one, titled motivation. Like I said earlier, motivation is the purpose or driving force behind our actions. Motivation can be categorized based on what drives people to act. These drives can be external forces, such as rewards and punishments, or they can be internal forces where the behavior is personally gratifying. Now, external forces, these are coming from outside oneself, they create extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation can include rewards for showing a desired behavior or avoiding punishment if the desired behavior is not achieved. Now, motivation that comes from within oneself, this is referred to as intrinsic motivation. This can be driven by interest in a task or just pure enjoyment. Now, in this objective, we really want to discuss the primary views of motivation. And kind of to foreshadow, we're going to discuss how the primary views of motivation include instincts that elicit natural behavior. They're going to include the desire to maintain optimal levels of arousal. They're going to include the drive to reduce uncomfortable states. And they're also going to include the goal of satisfying both physiological and psychological needs. Now with that, we can begin to understand motivation through a couple of theories, starting off with instinct theory. Early attempts to understand the basis of motivation really focused on instincts, which are innate fixed patterns of behavior in response to stimuli. Now, according to the instinct theory of motivation, people are driven to do certain behaviors based on evolutionary programmed instincts. This theory was one of the first to describe motivation, and it was derived from Darwin's theory of evolution. And actually, William James, the father of modern psychology, was one of the first to write about human instincts in his 1890 publication called Principles of Psychology. So in short, instinct theory of motivation says that people are driven to do certain behaviors based on evolutionarily programmed instincts. So that's instinct theory. Next up is arousal theory. Now, another factor that influences motivation is arousal. This is the psychological and physiological state of being awake and reactive to stimuli. Arousal involves the brainstem, it involves the autonomic nervous system, and it also involves the endocrine system, and it really plays a very important role in behavior and cognition. Arousal theory states that people perform actions in order to maintain an optimal level of arousal. So what that means is that if the arousal level falls below the optimal level, then the person is seeking to increase their arousal level. However, when the arousal level rises above their optimum level, then one is seeking to decrease arousal. Additionally, the yerkes dodson law, it postulates this U-shaped function between the level of arousal and performance, and this law states that performance is worse at extremely high 
and low levels of arousal, and it's optimal at some intermediate level. We can see that in this figure right here. The x-axis is arousal from low to high, the y-axis is performance from weak to strong, and we notice that at low arousal levels and at high arousal levels, performance is weak. However, there is an optimal arousal and optimal performance region. When you are at low arousal, weak performance, what you would want to do is increase attention and interest. If you are at high arousal and weak performance, then your performance is probably being impaired because of strong anxiety. Again, the goal is that in order to perform actions, one must maintain an optimal level of arousal. And so you're aiming to be in a region that allows for that. Now, the optimal level of arousal, it's going to vary between different types of tasks. Okay, so lower levels are optimal for highly cognitive tasks, while higher levels are optimal for activities that require physical endurance and stamina. So again, arousal theory states that people perform actions in order to maintain an optimal level of arousal. The next theory we want to discuss is drive reduction theory. Drives are defined as internal states of tension that activate particular behaviors for focused goals. Drives are thought to originate within an individual without really requiring any external factors to motivate behavior. So in other words, drives help humans survive by creating an uncomfortable state and ensuring motivation to eliminate this state or to relieve this internal tension created by unmet needs. And on that note of unmet needs, needs, well, there's two things we want to talk about in this realm, primary drives and secondary drives. Primary drives include things like the need for food, water, and warmth. And primary drives motivate us to sustain bodily processes in homeostasis. Homeostasis is the regulation of the entire internal environment to maintain an optimal and stable set of conditions. In homeostatic regulations, external factors are going to be encountered that might affect that regulation, but the system is going to react to push the body back to its optimal state. And homeostasis is usually controlled by negative feedback loops. Now, I usually like to explain negative feedback loops using a real-life example, and I think the best one is when we think about the thermostat. So a thermostat is set to a desired temperature and then sensor monitors the air temperature in relation to that set desired temperature. If the air temperature gets too cold, then the heater will turn on. And if the temperature gets too warm, the heater will turn off. And negative feedback loops in the body operate the same way. When our bodies are lacking nutrients and energy, feedback systems are going to release hormones that create a hunger drive and motivate eating. And then after you consume that delicious food and are full, feedback is sent to the brain to turn off the hunger drive. And that way, you eat when you need it, all right, and you stop eating when you're full. And it's all done through this negative feedback system. Now, we also have seen other kinds of negative feedback systems in our MCAT journey. When we talked about the endocrine system, we saw that there is negative feedback in the endocrine system, like you see here in this depiction. Now, with that out of the way, additional drives that are not directly related to biological processes, these are called secondary drives. So we said primary drives, they motivate us to sustain bodily processes in homeostasis, but then additional drives that are not directly related to biological processes, these are called secondary drives. These drives are thought to stem from learning. So the drive to go to medical school and become a physician, that is an example of secondary drive. And you future doctors will do exactly that. So, drive reduction theory, in short, 
to put all of this into context, it really explains that motivation is based on the goal of eliminating uncomfortable states. With that, we can move on to need-based theories. Needs are also motivators that influence human behavior. And through this lens, motivation can be described as how we allocate our energy and resources to best satisfy these needs. Motivation thus determines which behaviors are most important to pursue, how much effort will be taken, and for how long the effort will be maintained. Now, Abraham Maslow, he observed that certain needs will yield a greater influence on our motivation. And he established what is referred to as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He classified needs into five groups and assigned different levels of priority to each group. This is what you see in this pyramid scheme right here. The first four levels of the pyramid, they correspond to physiological needs, safety and security, love and belonging, and self-esteem. The highest level of the pyramid, it corresponds to self-actualization or the need to realize one's fullest potential. Maslow theorized that if the lowest level of need is not met, motivation to meet that need will be the highest priority. And then once that need is met, uh, once that need is met if additional needs exist, they will be satisfied based on priority. So, for example, a person's most basic motivation will be to satisfy physiological needs. This includes breathing, food, water, sex, sleep, homeostasis, etc. Then this is followed by the need to establish a safe and secure environment. So security of body, employment, resources, etc. And then it's love and belonging, and so on and so forth. Another need based motivational theory is the self-determination theory. This emphasizes the role of three universal needs. One, autonomy. This is the need to be in control of one's actions and ideas. Two, competence. This is the need to complete and excel at difficult tasks. And three, relatedness. This is the need to feel accepted and wanted in relationships. Now, before we end off objective one, there are just two other theories of motivation that we want to know for the MCAT, but we only need to know these very briefly. So we have the incentive theory and the expectancy value theory. So the incentive theory explains that behavior is motivated not by need or arousal, but by the desire to pursue rewards and to avoid punishment. And then the expectancy value theory, it states that the amount of motivation needed to reach a goal is a result of both the individual's expectation of success in reaching the goal and the degree to which they value succeeding at that goal. So with that, we've covered everything we need to know in our first objective. Now we can move into our second objective on emotion. Emotion is a natural, instinctive state of mind derived from one's circumstances, mood, or relationships with others. What does psychology have to tell us about emotions? That is the goal of objective two. And we're going to start by discussing the three elements of an emotion. You have the physiological response, the behavioral response, and the cognitive response. So let's go over each one of these, starting off with the physiological response. When a feeling is first experienced, arousal is stimulated by the autonomic nervous system. The physiological component is going to include changes in your heart rate, your breathing rate, skin temperature, and blood pressure. And while it might be hard to always recognize these changes and associate them with an emotion in everyday life, these changes are real and they have been detected in laboratory settings. Then we have the behavioral response. The behavioral component of an emotion includes facial expressions and body language. So for example, a smile, a friendly hand gesture, or even a subtle head tilt towards someone, that's commonly recognized as warm and happy signals. On the other hand, a frown, RBF, looking downwards, those are all recognized as sad or avoidant signals. 
Then we have the cognitive response. The cognitive component of emotion, this is the subjective interpretation of the feeling being experienced. And determination of one's emotion, this is going to be largely based on memories of past experiences and the perception of the cause of the emotion. Now that we've covered the three elements of an emotion, let's talk about universal emotions. So Darwin made the argument that emotions are a result of evolution. And so emotions and their corresponding expressions are universal. He explained that all humans evolved the same set of facial muscles to show the same expressions when communicating emotions, regardless of their society or culture. Of course, this sparked an ongoing discussion of the relationship between emotion and culture among both psychologists and sociologists. Paul Ekman described, actually, a set of basic emotions that are recognized by societies around the world. And then, over time, psychologists have revised this list. And so, what we can see here is the seven universal emotions that we need to know for the MCAT. So, let's go over these. We're going to go over the emotion, and we're also going to go over the facial expression cues for that emotion. So first and foremost, we're going to talk about happiness or enjoyment. The facial expression cue for this is a smile or wrinkling around the eyes and raised cheeks. Then we have sadness. Sadness, the facial cues for sadness is obviously a frown and your inner eyebrows are kind of pulled up and together. Then we have contempt. The facial expression cues for this is that, you know, one corner of the mouth tends to be pulled upwards. Then we have surprise. The facial expression cues for surprise is you have widened eyes, your eyebrows are pulled up and curved, your jaw opens. Then we have fear. Here, your eyes also widen, eyebrows pulled up and together, and the lips are pulled towards the ears. Then there is disgust, and the facial expression cues for disgust is nose wrinkling and or raising of the upper lip. And then last but certainly not least, we have anger, and the facial cues for anger is you're glaring, eyebrows pulled down and together, and your lips are pressed tightly together. Now, again, while emotions are experienced universally, it is argued that they can be affected greatly by culture. And cultural dissimilarities in emotion include varying reactions to similar events, differences in the emotional experience itself, the behavior that's exhibited in response to an emotion, as well as the perception of that emotion by others within society. Now, Something else that's really important for us to talk about is the adaptive role of emotion. So in accordance with Darwin's thoughts on universal emotion, the evolutionary perspective states that everything we do, think, and feel is really based on specialized functional programs that are designed for any problem we encounter. These programs are functionally coordinated in order to produce a cohesive response. Emotions are thought to be evolutionary ad adaptations due to situations that are encountered over the history of the human species in the hopes to guide sensory processing, physiological response, as well as behavior. In addition to that, different emotions are thought to have evolved in, during different periods in history. So keeping all that in mind, the three components of an emotion, universal emotions, and adaptive role of emotions, what we want to talk about next is theories of emotions. So let's set the stage for discussing theories of emotion. Early psychologists, they believed that the cognitive component of emotion led to the physiological component, which then produced the behavioral component. So in other words, the feeling of anger started with perception of a negative stimulus, which caused physiological changes like increased skin temperature, which then resulted in behavior such as yelling. Now, this explanation assumes that feeling precedes arousal, which precedes 
action. So that's our starting point here as we discuss different theories of emotion. We're going to start off with the James Lange theory. So William James, the founder of functionalist theory, he viewed the progression of these emotional elements a little differently. And so did Carl Lange, and they developed a theory of emotion that was called the James Lange theory of emotion. And according to this theory, a stimulus results first in physiological arousal, which leads to a secondary response in which the emotion is labeled. So James believed that when peripheral organs receive information and respond, that response is then labeled as an emotion by the brain. So for example, a car cutting you off on the highway is a stimulus for elevated heart rate and blood pressure and increased skin temperature. These physiological responses result in the cognitive labeling of anger. I must be angry because my skin is hot and my blood pressure is high. And so by extension, an emotion would not be processed without feedback from the peripheral organs. This theory predicts that individuals who cannot mount a sympathetic response, like patients with spinal cord injuries, should show decreased levels of emotion. However, further studies have proven this claim to be false. All right, so that's our first theory. The next one we want to talk about is Canon Bard. Walter Cannon and Philip Bard, they developed another scheme for explaining emotional components that they called the Cannon Bard theory of emotions. In an attempt to, cha- to, to test this first theory, James Lange theory, Cannon studied the expression of emotion and its relationship to feedback from the sympathetic nervous system using cats whose afferent nerves had been severed. He hypothesized that physiological arousal and feeling an emotion, they occur at the same time, not in sequence. And so severing the feedback should actually not alter the emotion experienced. In this theory, a person will respond with action after experiencing the emotion both mentally and physically. Now, Bard, he was a student of Cannon's. He further explained that when exposed to a stimulus, sensory information is received and then sent to both the cortex and the sympathetic nervous system simultaneously by the thalamus. And so the Cannon-Bard theory of emotion, it states that the cognitive and physiological components of emotion occur simultaneously and then they result in the behavioral component of emotion or action. So I am scared because I see a snake and now my heart is racing. Let me out of here. So that's like a thought that could happen like that. All right. Now, critics of James Lange theory, they cite this study that was done by Cannon Bard, the the severed afferent nerve study, as support for the Cannon Bard theory. But there are also weaknesses in this theory as well, just like there was weaknesses in the James Lange theory. So the Cannon Bard theory, it fails to explain the vagus nerve, which is a cranial nerve that functions as a feedback system conveying information from the peripheral organs back to the central nervous system. Now, last but not least, we're going to cover the third theory. This is the sha- uh, the Shaster Singer theory. I think that's how you pronounce the name. Forgive me if I've mispronounced this. And this is also termed the cognitive arousal theory or the two factor theory. It states that both arousal and the labeling of arousal based on environment must occur in order for an emotion to be experienced. So I am excited because my heart rate is racing and everyone else seems happy. So what's unique to this theory is this aspect of cognitive appraisal. To feel an emotion, one must consciously analyze the environment in relation to nervous system arousal. So to study this, Um, Stanley, 
Shaster and Jeremy Singer, they gave injections of epinephrine or placebo to groups of subjects that were either informed, ig ignorant, or misinformed. They also manipulated external cues in the study by having an actor either act happy or act angry. They observed that epinephrine did result in increased physiological arousal. However, they also discovered that the environment and cognitive processing affected the emotion that was experienced by the subjects. So the misinformed and ignorant groups, they experienced the highest level of emotion. And so they explain this by stating that a subject experiencing physiological arousal with no explanation or with a misleading explanation will attribute that arousal to the surrounding environment and then label themselves happy or angry based on the emotion and the behavior of the actor. And so we can summarize everything that we've learned about these three theories here. All right. So we have the theory What's the first response? What's the second response? So for the James Lange, your first response, nervous system arousal. Second response, conscious emotion. For the Cannon Bard theory, all right, you have a stimulus. First response to that is nervous system arousal and conscious emotion. And the second response is going to be some sort of action. And for the last theory, after a stimulus, the first response will be nervous system arousal and cognitive appraisal. And the second response is going to be conscious emotion. With that, we can go ahead and move into a discussion on the limbic system. Experiencing emotion is a complex process that involves many parts of the brain. The most notable of these circuits is the limbic system. This system is made out of the amygdala, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and the fornix, septal nuclei, and parts of the cerebral cortex. It plays a large role in both motivation and emotion. And we've discussed the limbic system in previous chapters in this playlist, as well as in the MCAT biology playlist. Playlist. However, let's just refresh our memory. The amygdala is a small round structure that signals the cortex about stimuli related to attention and emotion. It processes the environment, it detects external cues, and it learns from the person's surroundings in order to produce emotion. This region is also associated with fear, and it plays a role in human emotion through the interpretation of facial expressions. The thalamus, it functions as a preliminary sensory processing station, and it routes information to the cortex and other appropriate areas of the brain. The hypothalamus, it's located between the thalamus, it synthesizes and releases a variety of neurotransmitters, and it serves many homeosta uh, homeostatic functions. It's also involved in modulating emotion. Now, the hippocampus within the temporal lobe is primarily involved in creating long-term memories. Along with the functions of the amygdala and the hypothalamus, the storage and retrieval of emotional memories is really key in producing an emotional response. The hippocampus also aids in creating context for stimuli to lead to an emotional experience. Now, when an emotion is experienced, Sensory systems, they transmit this information into both the explicit memory system that's primarily controlled by the hippocampus in the medial temporal lobe and the implicit memory system that's controlled by the amygdala. Both memory systems are used for both the formation and retrieval of emotional memories. Now the conscious or the explicit memory is the memory of experiencing the actual emotion. So like remembering that you were happy at your high school graduation or you were sad when you lost a loved one. Those are all explicit memory. The unconscious or implicit memory is referred to as emotional memory. This is the storage of the actual feelings of emotion associated with an event. Now the ability to distinguish and interpret others' facial expressions. This is primarily controlled by the temporal lobe with some input from the occipital lobe as well. 
this function is actually lateralized. So the right hemisphere is more active when discerning facial expressions than the left. There are also gender differences, so women demonstrate more activation of these brain areas than men. Then we want to talk about the prefrontal cortex. This prefrontal cortex is the anterior portion of the frontal lobe. It's associated with planning intricate cognitive functions. It's also associated with expressing personality and making decisions. The prefrontal cortex also receives arousal input from the brainstem coordinating arousal and cognitive states. It's been demonstrated that the left prefrontal cortex is associated with positive emotions and the right prefrontal cortex with negative emotions. Now, the dorsal prefrontal cortex, that's associated with attention and cognition, while the ventral prefrontal cortex connects with regions of the brain that's responsible for experiencing emotion. Now, one more thing that we want to state and talk about is that the autonomic system is also related to emotion. We've made many statements to this point already in this chapter, right? The autonomic system is also related to emotion. Specific physiological reactions are associated with specific emotions. Skin temperature, heart rate, breathing rate, and blood pressure are all affected when you're experiencing emotion. Now, with that being said, we can move into our last and final objective on stress. In all aspects of life, at all times of the day, we make decisions, overcome challenges, and continue forward. And it is our response to challenging events, be they physical, emotional, cognitive, or behavioral, that defines stress. The first thing that we want to discuss in Objective 3 is cognitive appraisal of stress. Cognitive appraisal is the subjective evaluation of a situation that induces stress. And this process consists of two stages. Stage one or primary appraisal is the initial evaluation of the environment and the associated threat. This appraisal can be identified as irrelevant, benign, positive, or stressful. If primary appraisal re re reveals a threat, then stage two appraisal begins. Secondary appraisal is directed at evaluating whether the organism can cope with this stress. This appraisal involves the evaluation of three things. One, harm or damage caused by the environment, two, threat or the potential for future damage caused by the event, and three, challenge or the potential to overcome and possibly benefit from the event. Individuals who perceive themselves as having the ability to cope with the event are going to experience less stress than those who don't. But in general, appraisal and stress levels are personal because individuals have different skills, abilities, and coping mechanisms. This leads us to talking about types of stressors. A stressor is a biological element, external condition, or event that leads to a stress response. Common stressors include environmental factors, daily events, workplace or academic settings, social ex uh, expectations, chemical and biological stressors. Stressors can also be psychological. Stressors are classified as either causing distress or causing you stress. Distress occurs when experiencing unpleasant stressors, whereas eustress is a result of positive condition, and it can include things like life events, graduating from college, getting married, scoring a perfect score on your MCAT, which you're going to do. But while they are positive, any event requiring a person to change or adapt their lifestyle obviously leads to some sort of stress. Now, stress level, fun fact, can be measured in quote-unquote life change units in a system called the social readjustment rating scale. Now, the follow-up to all this is What's the physiological response to stressors? So when subjected to stress, the body initially responds via the sympathetic nervous system. The fight or flight response initiates an increase in heart rate and a decrease in digestion with all available energy being reserved for reacting to the stressful event. 
Now, the sequence of physiological responses is called the general adaptation syndrome, and it consists of three distinct stages that you see here in this figure and that we're going to talk about now. First is alarm, or the initial reaction to a stress stressor and the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Shortly after, the hypothalamus is going to uh, stimulate the pituitary to secrete adrenocorticotropic hormone. This hormone stimulates the adrenal glands to produce cortisol, which maintains the steady supply of blood sugar that's needed to respond to stressful environments. Now, the hypothalamus also activates the adrenal medulla, which secretes epinephrine and norepinephrine to activate the sympathetic nervous system. The next stage is resistance, in which the continuous release of hormones allows the sympathetic nervous system to remain engaged to, fri to fight the stressor. And then last, a person is going to experience exhaustion when the body can no longer maintain an elevated response with sympathetic nervous system activity. At this point, individuals become more susceptible to illnesses and medical conditions, and organ systems can actually begin to deteriorate. In extreme cases, death can also result. So with that point, obviously, it's really important to learn to cope and manage your stress. And strategies for coping with stress really falls into two categories. Problem-focused strategies involve working to overcome a stressor, such as reaching out to family and friends for social support, confronting the issue head-on, and creating and following a plan of problem-solving actions. Emotionally focused strategies, they center instead on changing one's feelings about a stressor and they include taking responsibility for the issue or engaging in self-control or distancing oneself from the issue, engaging in wishful thinking and using positive reappraisal to focus on positive outcomes instead of the stressor. If you're feeling stressed, studying for the MCAT or going through school, please make sure that you reach out to a professional to get the help you need so that you are always taking care of your body and your mind. I know studying for the MCAT is an extremely stressful time, but I'm here with you. And if you need anything, you can always reach out. And with that, we have finished chapter five on motivation, emotion, and stress. I really hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.